one. So. All right, then. Dude, shut up, you slow. Wait, how's it? Dude. Oh, my volume. Okay. All right, sorry about that. Um, so thank you so much for joining. More people will definitely trickle in as we continue, but feel free to start now. <laughs> Getting egoed. He's not even here. Okay, there you go. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, let me try to see if I can uh, share my screen. Uh, let's see here. Okay. My share's better. Oh, my share's better. Let me see. Done. Where's John? Yeah, where's John at? He's a fraud. Okay. Um, I assume that you can all see my screen. And uh, I will try to monitor chat as well on the side. Um, can I get a yes on the chat uh, just to make sure that you're all able to hear me well and uh, see the screen as well? OK, good. Thank you. So wonderful. Thank you for uh, joining today. My name is Padu. And uh, I understand that uh, people are joining from uh, all parts of the world. Uh, and uh, I actually uh, am a professor and director at uh, George Mason University, which is in Virginia. And uh, I work in the broad area of uh, computational data science, scientific computing, machine learning, uh, and then I also have a uh, big passion for STEM education. So I helped develop the first ever high school data science class in the state of Virginia, uh, along with standards. Uh, so, um, so kids in the state of Virginia, in the, U in the US, can actually uh, take data science as a math uh, and CS credit. Uh, so many of you probably would have loved it if it was in uh, in high school when you studied. But uh, right now, it is starting to become the trend in uh, not in the workforce, but actually much, much before. In fact, I'm going to be developing the next class, which is called computational thinking, which will go for early grades. And this I'm also working with Ministry of Education in India and other countries uh, because uh, for example, India create, you know, put together something called the NEP, National Education Policy, uh, a big document of how they are restructuring education and the infrastructure in terms of grade levels and all that. If you read the document carefully, there's a word called computational thinking that's, that's everywhere in the document. And I've asked many people, what do they understand about it? It's completely different interpretations. And so, uh, at the end of the day, you know, you're going to be dealing with lots and lots of data. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to bring all those different aspects. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how many people are on the call, but uh, we'll see. I have some, uh, hopefully some activities that we can work together on and uh, we'll see how it goes uh, uh, in terms of uh, being able to participate uh, from different places. So once again, my name is Padu, and uh, I, my, I work in uh, different areas. Lately, in the last five years, I've been working on infectious diseases. And uh, what you're seeing here is uh, models created for uh, understanding the spread of COVID. Uh, S stands here for susceptible people that are potentially going to get COVID. E is for exposed people when susceptible people uh, end up meeting uh, somebody who's infected and uh, they could get exposed. They don't get infected immediately. That's what the E stands for. But then at some point, they could get infected. Uh, can someone tell in the chat what IA and IS could mean? Why are there two different infected here on the chat? What's an A and what a, what's, a, what's the uh, superscript stand for? Anyone? Well, A, uh, during COVID, many people were showing symptoms 
and uh, many of them were not showing symptoms. So when one was obvious, so they, these are called symptomatic and asymptomatic populations. So essentially, if you're exposed, you could become infected, but sometimes you show the symptoms and sometimes you don't. And so when you are not showing symptoms, well, you just don't know you had COVID and you just, uh, you could recover after 14 days or you could sh start showing symptoms. So you see these arrows coming down and then the symptoms, the ones that show symptoms, could actually go into Q. What could Q mean? On the chat, please. What could Q mean here? I, I'm i pretty sure you are, you know, quarantine exactly, Kevin. That's good. Don't worry. I'm just teaching you a little bit of modeling today, at the, as, as I was just telling you in terms of what I do. Exactly. Quarantine is correct. So if you you quarantine and, uh, you know, after a certain point you recover, R stands for recovery, or and then uh, if not, you rush to the hospital. That's the H. Of course, if you go to the hospital, two things could happen. You could recover or you could, what's the D there? Die. Exactly. So essentially, that's the model. You know, pretty straightforward model. Nothing uh, fancy about it. Many, many papers were written on this. Uh, even my students wrote papers on this. But what was interesting, I'll tell you in just a second, how my students took this to the next level uh, and was in a hackathon just like you guys. And, uh, you know, so these models are called compartmental models. It helps you to organize how a process is happening. And then, of course, you write down, uh, you know, in the modeling world, in the mathematical modeling world, you write down differential equations and then you try to do some simulations and all that stuff. So what you're seeing on the right side is deep learning and uh, a specific... Uh, idea called physics informed neural networks we know what neural networks are you know you give a thousand uh, or you know ten thousand or million images uh, of uh, cats and dogs and you train a network and then you bring a new picture of a dog and then the neural network has to figure out whether it's a cat or a dog now that's a classification problem that's just you know just going and telling you whether it's yes or no it's a binary or it could be uh, uh, other than binary as well but what if I actually add the physics on top of it? What if I tell the network that, uh, you know, you are tracking these susceptibles, infected, exposed, and all that stuff? So, so the physics is added into the network. It's a brand new idea in the last few years well, from one of my former students uh, who went to Brown and created it, uh, Brown University. And it's one of the fastest deep learning algorithms. It's published in Science. Uh, February 2020. If you want to go look it up, it's called PINS, P-I-N-N-S, Physics Informed Neural Networks. It's one of the fastest uh, algorithms. So uh, now people are applying it to different uh, applications like disease dynamics. And I'm going to show you what I've applied it to, and so you, uh, which connects to today's, today's talk. And then, of course, uh, uh, if you're traveling in the aircraft, the person sitting next to you is starting to cough. And the cough is, you know, the droplets are coming out. And then there is air from the vent that is pushing those droplets. So you got what is called as fluid dynamics. And the droplets have their own dynamics, which is called scalar transport. And it's coming slowly towards you. Now you got disease models that starts to take over. And then you start to actually simulate that. So this is our latest project. And we try to actually, so these are all called multi-physics. Okay. Finally, I want to say, you know, even though all this sounds a little technical, I want to tell you uh, uh, the pattern that we received uh, last year. So imagine you're a drug addict and you come back from, uh, you know, from rehabilitation and you're sitting and watching TV. At the exact moment on TV, let's say a syringe comes up. So you are tempted to take drugs. This is also applied to mental health, by the way. This is, uh, I have... Uh, IBM starting to ask us for PTSD and different things, suicide and things like that. But I, our application first was for addiction. So essentially, your body neurobiofeedback changes. At the exact moment, you have a wearable. And the wearable is capturing all sorts of data. Your heart rate is going to go berserk. Your sweat index is going to go crazy. Your electro, you know, dermal uh, responses inside, lots of things happen. So all those readings are, they go to the cloud and you have machine learning algorithms that will trigger an app, a mobile app. Now I'm talking to you about, you know, 
a product development at the end of a hackathon. So the app will call you exactly at the time you want to take drugs. So you are tempted to take drugs. Your best friend will call you and say, hey, let's go for coffee. Your mom will call you and say, what are you doing? Right? So it's in the moment distraction. That's what we got the patent for. So I hope you understand how I, I put modeling, which is running some bunch of equations in the background with some machine learning. And everyone in the world wants to create some, some kind of an app. But what I'm noticing is most of the people are creating apps for money and making uh, it commercial. But when you make apps for impact, it's much more satisfying. You can make money, but also uh, it's much more satisfying. So I know you have something around mental health. I'm actually working with mental health as well and modeling mental health, believe it or not. Okay. So I want to make sure you understand, do not do projects or hackathons and all that stuff for just, you know, making yourself famous. Try to make others happy. This philosophy is called design thinking. A human-centered approach to problem solving, a course that I teach. If you want to really uh, develop a product, you want to really develop a product for the user, not for yourself. And that's what is called as human-centered approach to problem solving. You need to start with empathy, and then you got to define the problem statement, and then you got to ideate solutions, and then you got to prototype it, and then you got to test it. So when you come to a hackathon, you're already thinking of prototyping. I strongly suggest you go through the other phases and I will tell you a very simple story and then I'll, I'll start the lecture. So a few years back, 2015 or so, I took a group of students from Princeton University, from George Mason, from Puerto Rico uh, to, uh, you know, there was this comp, there was a opportunity for me to host some students in uh, Tanzania. Africa. And, uh, you know, uh, my project got selected and uh, I was uh, uh, allowed to interview some students to take with me to Africa. And uh, of course, I've never met these students. I only met these students online when I interviewed them. So I select them, about six students. I take them to Africa. On African side, I have about 20 African students also waiting there because they are all going to do projects together. So uh, these students, of course, from the US are begging to know what the project was, right? And I did a hackathon there and I did a Shark Tank and all that stuff. But they begged me for the project uh, before we left to Africa. I said, take it easy. You know, we are going to go to Africa and I'll tell you what the project is. And... Uh, because I didn't give the details of the project. I said they will be working on some cool data hackathon and all these different things and all that stuff. So I meet the students at, uh, in Africa. I mean, when we landed and, uh, and you know, the Princeton kids are desperate to know what the project is and all that stuff. And then I say, okay, the project is on uh, uh, tracking. Uh, I mean, actually the project is on, uh, uh, I just told the problem. The problem was every 15 minutes, an elephant is being killed. We got six weeks time to figure out how to, you know, solve this problem. And I just kept it at a very high level. So, of course, some of the kids really got excited. And uh, uh, it's in the middle. I mean, we land in the evening around 8.30 or so. The vice chancellor of the university, which is the president of the university, who's a good friend of mine, picks me up, picks us up. We go to... Uh, Arusha, Nelson Mandela African Institute of Science and Technology. This is, uh, these are institutes in four institutes in Africa, which was created by President Mandela. And after he visited IIT Bombay, MIT, and KAIST, KAIST, which is in, uh, you know, uh, in Korea. So he wanted to come up with a model for uh, top, in, like the best and the brightest in Africa to come to four of these institutes. These institutes are all called NMAIST, Nelson Mandela African Institute of Science and Technology. Each one focuses on different things. One is in Tanzania, one is in Ouagadougou, one is in South Africa, one is in Abuja. Uh, so I give them the problem uh, at, you know, in the night, uh, they go into their respective rooms uh, and I, I have to tell you this story because uh, you're all engaged in a hackathon. I don't want to want you to go through what these what we went through. 
So uh, at 3.30 in the morning, early in the morning, I couldn't sleep because I was jet lagged. 3.30 in the morning, I get email from this uh, group of students. Uh, uh, these were the kids from Princeton. Of course, Princeton, as you know, is number, you know, the, they claim to be the number one university in the world, which is great, which, which is true. Also, as in some of their programs are top notch. Uh, so they send me an email saying, uh, oh, this is, uh, we've solved the problem. I'm like, what? You got six weeks to solve this problem. Again, message for you guys. You got enough time for the hackathon. So don't finish the problem within the first 20 minutes and think you have finished the problem. That's number one message for you. Okay. So I said, uh, you know, we got six weeks to solve it, but I'll see you at breakfast and I'll, I'll listen to your solution. So I go to breakfast and these three students has, have not slept all night because they wanted to impress me. And they wanted to show the solution as I was walking into the breakfast uh, uh, counter. And I asked them what the solution was. And they told me a solution. Right? Again, what's the problem again? The problem is elephants are dying, are being killed every 15 minutes. You got to come up with a STEM solution. These are all STEM students. So they showed me a solution. I looked at it and said, good job. And then I didn't say anything else. And I asked them to eat something. And they had not slept. Their eyes were all red. And then I asked them, uh, I, I went to the side. I called the vice chancellor. I played a little game. Uh, every student I work with, I played devil's advocate. And exactly what I did was call the vice chancellor and postpone the 10 o'clock meeting that we had where I was going to introduce all these students to him to evening three o'clock. There was a reason. Okay. And so I go back to the students uh, and say, hey, uh, the vice chancellor just moved the meeting. I had to do a little white lie and say, uh, we're going to start at three o'clock instead of 10 o'clock. So go enjoy the campus, you know, go around, walk and all that. And here's the response I got from the students. They said, that's great, Dr. Seshayar. That gives us uh, time to add more slides. I'm like, wait, you're not here to solve a problem within like uh, a day. You're here for six weeks. But then that's how these kids were thinking because they wanted to like, you know, do everything and all that stuff. I mean, this is the type of kids you deal with when you, you know, are bringing people from these universities and all that. So I said, that's fine. You know, do uh, get ready and all that stuff. So three o'clock, just before three o'clock, I take the students to the vice chancellor's office and uh, the vice chancellor then, uh, you know, it's so good for these students in the United States. It's so hard to get into a president's office and get a picture and stand next to him or her and all that stuff. So they did all that stuff. And then they actually, uh, uh, I looked at the vice chancellor. I said, vice chancellor, are we ready? And he said, yes, we are ready. I'm going to take you to another room. The students had no idea, absolutely no idea. Okay. So uh, this is almost like a hackathon on steroids. Okay. So I take them, we all take them into a room. The, inside a room, there are about 100 people sitting, just like right now, 100 people sitting. Sitting. And this is deans, faculty, students, everybody from the university that could come. So the vice chancellor goes, ladies and gentlemen, here is students from one of the top institutions in the world and uh, and uh, you know they are here to present a solution to a problem that we have been struggling with elephants are being killed every 15 minutes and they are here to present a stem solution now before i actually tell you what happened the rest of the story i want you to i want to brainstorm on the chat give me solutions on the give me tell me what you would say if this if you were one of those students where is your mind going i'm curious this is a hackathon practice you know this is very important training for doing these types of short term uh, wins okay what are you thinking on the chat if i had to present with no sleep <laughs> good one uh you don't have to present i just uh, you know i just on the fly ask them uh, because they had a solution to share, I, I thought I'll make them rich and famous right there. So I said, go for it. So let me tell you, and then I'll ask you again. So I asked the students to go present. 
Now, this is 255 right now in Tanzania. Now, what the vice chancellor and the rest of the people that were sitting in the crowd and I know, the students obviously did not know. Because at 3 p.m., uh, you know, we got the, they call it the beamer, the computer projector is all ready and they are, they have their, you know, it's amazing. They had like 25 PowerPoint slides ready. This is like day one, day one. They've already solved the problem. This is the type of kids, right? And 2.55 it is, p.m., 3 p.m., the power goes off in Tanzania. This is load shedding in Tanzania. Now talk about working on a hackathon without any resources. Even, even more fun, right? So the beamer shuts off, the room goes dark, and the students have to present. Are you feeling it now? So, but the students were, uh, I would suddenly realize that I hadn't really understood the reality of the problem. It's coming, Jayanti. Wait, wait, watch, watch what I'm about to say. So the students then did not give up. And that's the attitude I wanted to see. The students did not give up. They said, Dr. Seshir, it's okay. We'll still present the solution. One of the students holds the laptop like this because they have the PowerPoints on the laptop. One of the students points their finger and the and the other student is talking. This is their three-way, three-group team that is trying to show off in front of everyone. The Mission Impossible music plays from the laptop. On the from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen, a mega transformer. You know, the movie transformer starts to walk in the Serengeti. Serengeti is the you know big wide open lands in the in Tanzania, which is where you go for game and uh, all these different things and all this stuff. That's persistence, that's perseverance, and I appreciated that from the students. But what they presented was a transformer in the middle of Africa. Seriously, and that's exactly what I said. Are you kidding me? Well, I didn't say it that way. I said said it in a very very nice way. Do you think you can bring these mega transformers in the middle of Serengeti? And I said, what do they do? Well, they'll shoot the poachers that are killing the elephants. I said, that's awesome solution. But did you know that in Tanzania or any of these parks that you go, there are the big five. And the big five includes the, ele the African elephant, the uh, leopard, the uh, lion, the water buffalo, and uh, 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 I forget uh, the rhinoceros. Okay, so I I told them even if there's a transformer, you know that lions. Have you seen African lions? Have you seen African elephants? They'll just rip it apart. So I had to play devil's advocate at that point, and that's the best way to do a hackathon to keep who is more uh, mentoring, keep playing devil's advocate. So I I did uh, you know this, and so when I did that. They didn't give up. They said, no, 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 Dr. Seshir, we'll, we'll hide these transformers under trees. Luckily, on the wall, they had a big mural of the Serengeti. And you could see trees every kilometer. One kilometer, there's an acacia tree. I said, are you kidding me? Look at the trees. Look at the distance of the trees. And even if you place it under trees, do you know who's sitting on the trees? The leopards. So at that point, the students understood that I was playing with them as in I was getting, trying to get the best out of them. Then I said, let me ask you some, uh, so there was this one kid in the crowd, in the uh, group of six students, uh, he started saying, and he didn't go to Princeton, okay? So uh, so he said, Dr. Seshire, uh, maybe we can use birds. So I that caught my interest. I said, keep talking. He said, maybe, maybe birds are flying and actually they are, watching when the poachers are trying to come and uh, set up shop to shoot these elephants and they start shouting very, very loud. I said, how will they uh, communicate? They said, oh, they'll shout and uh, to other birds and the other birds will shout. So it was interesting that uh, uh, he, he figured out uh, something, but he did not know what the product is, but he had an idea. Anyone knows, I mean, obviously the Princeton students on the other side are already raising their hands. Like, the, you know, the first bench people who are like me, 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 because they figured out the idea. What do you think they figured out? What, what do you think was that idea leading to? 
the birds chirping and shouting and saying, hey, there's a poacher. Any ideas? Exactly, Arul Raj. Well done. Road drones. That's exactly what we ended up building in the six weeks. So it turns out that all he was trying to say was drones, but he had never seen a drone before. He's from Puerto Rico and he was, uh, you know, he's never, he wanted to, but uh, sometimes what happens is the ideas don't have to come from the best and the brightest or, uh, you know, uh, that go to the top, top institutions in any of the, you know, any of the, I don't care who you are. The ideas can come from people that are very practical oriented. Even though he did not know the word drone, he was able to tell the idea because I pulled, I pushed him. I said, how do they do? He said, they will talk to each other. That's called swarming. And so once they talked to then I, I pushed him even further because once, once somebody said drones, I said, how do the drones actually, uh, they're watching from the top. And when they see from the top, they only see a blob. They don't see an actual elephant. They don't see an actual poacher. Everything is a blob because, you know, it's from the up. It's just a, a flat thing. And uh, so now tell me, how do you identify between uh, an animal and, uh, and uh, uh, poacher, for example? Anyone? This is, I'm, I'm pushing you guys. You guys are doing your hackathon. If you are not able to critically think, you'll just be coding and just delivering something. This is the type of challenge. Very good, John. I like the way you're thinking. Color. Well, you know, color, I don't know, human color versus from the drones, it's all going to be black. Uh, you know, object detection. Very good. Keep talking more. I mean, you could put a sensor. Yes, you could do an object detection, but then the detects what? That's the question. Detects what? What's different about a elephant versus a human? Yes, size and shape is good, Arulaj. Other things. See, you're already starting to think now. Convolution <laughs> network. Wow, you guys are thinking very high level. I'm thinking something very, very simple. Uh, edge detection is great. Uh, all this is fantastic. You're telling me techniques. I'm just telling, asking you simple. IR camera, there you go. Okay, uh, FLIR cameras, you know, temperature, you know, so warm blooded, cold blood. So sometimes you have to go back to your middle school and high school textbooks to really think about simply. Yeah. Yes, it works, John. That it works. We did it. Okay, so so now you got now you know you can uh, figure out whether it's an animal or a or a human. Now uh, let me ask you the harder question: How do you know if the human is a poacher or a ranger before you can take any action? A ranger is a good cop, and poacher is a bad person. How do you know? How do you distinguish between a bad person and a good person? The one that is trying to kill the elephant and the one that is trying to protect the elephants. Hard, right? So this is what I'm. I'm, I'm glad that it is. You, you guys are seriously thinking now. So it turns out that to get an African elephant, very good metal detector for gun. Nice, nice uh, direction, Ali. So for to get a big African elephant down, you have to carry these mega guns, not a revolver that a uh, a ranger carries often. And those two types of metals will. Uh, radiate different types of frequencies. So imagine having a frequency sensor. So it's all about what should I have on the drone that's ended up being our bigger problem and how can I capture it? So all went well. Of course, we could not, uh, we built the drone and uh, we could not take it to the Serengeti and fly around uh, elephants because it was not, uh, you know, you had to get lots of permissions. It takes a longer time and all that. Later on, my uh, student did it and got his PhD out of this, but uh, in Africa. But then in the six weeks, we had built something and we flew this on campus around dogs. And so we, we uh, uh, you know, that was kind of a prototype and all that stuff. So it was all great. Six weeks happened. On the last day, last two days, we are asked to present our results. So the... It's a two days of presentation. On the first day, on the morning slot, uh, there are two poachers, former poachers, and two rangers sitting next to the vice chancellor. And we are like showing off like, hey, we did this, blah, blah, blah. We built this thing. I did a hackathon, blah, blah, blah. We built this cool product and all that stuff. Great. 
afternoon session we did we talked about more about the sensors and all that stuff great but i noticed that next to the vice chancellor one of the rangers was missing day 2 morning we are presenting our final session where we want to put it all together and all that stuff and we are presenting the second ranger is missing so i got suspicious i was like what is going on uh, why why are these people missing from the crowd they did they not like what we did or whatever it is and all this stuff or they you know and the vice chancellor kept smiling the whole time and just like he and i played devil's advocate he was playing devil's advocate with me and my students okay here is what happened so after we finish he comes to me he pats my back and said padu you did a great job training your students and my students on design thinking but i have to say that you guys failed you failed because 62 percent of the poachers or the rangers did you guys get the story that i just told you 62 percent of the poachers that are killing the elephants or the rangers i hope that is striking something in your head and that's exactly what happened that was the biggest uh, failure i have faced after six years or six weeks of hard work but it taught at us a lesson. And the lesson is if you directly go to solve the problem without doing step number one, empathy. We did some empathy, but we asked the wrong people the wrong questions at the beginning. So always remember in your hackathon, don't just jump into I am the world's best coder and I'm going to code away. That's it's worthless. If you don't know the problem that you're solving, who you're solving the problem for, then it's not worth you know, competing in something like this. You got to really know the why before the what. The what is the last. First is the why, then the how, and then the what. I hope you got this message from my story. So we ended up writing a major article in IEEE on this, and it got accepted. So just to let you know, do your empathy very well in a hackathon. Empathy is needs assessment. Step number one. Step number two, define your problem statement. There may be many, many statements that you have you will come up with, but then you prioritize and figure out which problem you want to solve. Step number three, ideate solutions. Come up with lots of solutions, crazy solutions. Come up with the most accessible one. Step number four, prototype it. And I'm going to tell you a little story about prototyping and then test it, right? Of course, you won't have time to test it immediately, but maybe on small, uh, you know, test it on other groups and all that stuff. So I hope you understand the power of this human centered approach to problem solving where empathy cannot be just under uh, underestimated. OK, so I wanted to tell you with a personal failure story. And that's very important. And I know I wanted to talk about data. Uh, and uh, I just realized I just uh, ended up speaking uh, almost uh, my whole time. But do I have 20 minutes, uh, Tejas or uh, Lux? I mean, I don't know. Do I have 20 minutes or 25 minutes or something? Um, yeah, you definitely have 20 minutes. OK, good. Here goes. Now let me tell you the rest of the story. So OK. so. Uh, so when I say societal challenges, I mean challenges that go all the way to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, for example. So uh, some of these uh, include everything from zero hunger to uh, no poverty, peace and justice. So uh, the example that I talked talk to you about is all around peace and justice uh, and strong institutions. Now, uh, I do have... Uh, you know, want to engage you. So, you know, let's see. Uh, I'm kind of gonna. I'm collecting data here in terms of how many people understand. Or so you're looking at a picture, and uh, anyone. Uh, so it's a famous pedagogical strategy called uh, "What do you notice and what do you wonder?" Uh, anyone notice this person? Anyone wonder what what game he he is? Uh, you know, here to demonstrate. Anyone? Soccer. Good guess. Yeah, it looks like a nice soccer. Uh, t-shirt i was hoping that someone will recognize this person it is soccer it is soccer <laughs> world cup it is soccer but anyone recognize this guy oh nobody 
That's surprising. That tells how much we are like wedded to our own. Yes, Ali does it. Yes, <laughs> Sadia Mane, uh, a Senegal player, you know, one of the most popular players uh, in the world. And uh, another nice thing about him is, uh, you know, he supports a whole village. Uh, uh, yes, right now he's playing for me. That's exactly right. So, so uh, very, very popular. You know, people know Messi. If I'd shown Messi, maybe you would have immediately said, but this guy's as good as Messi and even maybe even better. Uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, he has lots of other things he does. He supports a whole village in Senegal. You know, he gives 200 euros to everybody in the village and things like that. So, you know, he's one of those really uh, different types of players and all that. So now I'm going to show you something else about him. What do you what do you notice? What do you notice? It's just a whole bunch of numbers. For those of you that have no clue on what soccer is or or how soccer is played or how numbers are being tallied and things like that, you're probably looking at it and saying, what is dribbles per game? What is interceptions per game? But let me pause for a second. The, the soccer fans here, uh, can you tell us some observations about Mane? These are Mane statistics. Any observations you can make? Nothing? You can't make, make any sense of this table? Well, that's what happens when I show this to most of the people. They don't know what, what to even make, make sense of because some, some people don't know soccer. Some people are given statistics like this. They don't know what is going on. Now let me show you something else of Mane. His evolution from 2017-18 to 2020-21. And it's a heat map of wherever Mane touched the ball with his feet. Now tell me a story. Oh, so Arul Raj noticed progressively increasing from the table, but would you make the same decision from the heat map? Is it obvious? Is it clear that he's progressively increasing? It seems like that, right? The heat is becoming stronger, right? What else do you see? What else? What is the other story that you see? What else do you see? Size has increased. Very good. That means he's shooting more. He's closer to the goal, Lux. That's exactly right. He shoots very good close to the mall. What else? Something else very interesting about this picture is heat map. Where does he shoot from? Do you see where he shoots from? Most of the time? The corner to the left. Exactly. So now notice what happened. When I showed you the table, you guys didn't talk too much. When I showed you this, now you guys are talking. So it's the power of visualization data visualization on how to actually tell a story by simply changing the uh, changing the way you present the story, right? So it's about how you tell the story and you're able to talk so much, right? So, uh, and, you know, unfortunately, I always prepare like lots of slides, but uh, maybe I'll focus on data visualization. But I don't know which, uh, you know, as I said, you know, uh, this is a high school student that worked with me. She already has published four peer-reviewed papers. But what I want you to know, understand is uh, why it's a societal challenge she addressed is, you see there's a C compartment she added, which is when lift and lockdown happens. And then she studies inside the, inside the compartment domestic violence. Because when we are at home during COVID, domestic violence went up, opioids went up, mental health went up, all these disease, everything everything go you know all the depression uh, went up so she studied that using mathematical models so you know again uh, uh, she's one of the you know uh, really pro you know uh, she's uh, high uh, she's a, in, uh, in college right now but uh, a full ride to uh, one of the you know top institutions but uh, you know uh, and uh, she won the national level uh, uh, technology competition and things like that. So just to let you know how kids are thinking these days, that's a societal challenge. Uh, these two kids just finished with me uh, last uh, two weeks back, uh, one from Arizona and one from uh, California. And it is funded, this program was funded by the billionaire mathematician Simons. Uh, first time he's funding a undergraduate program. And these two people created the first ever model for patient detox journey. They did machine learning as well, and we are going. We are currently writing up the paper, and it will be published. I mean, it will be sent for publication, journal publication, peer-reviewed journal publication. Uh, a current student uh, who will be presenting next week is actually studying uh, denial rates for black applicants. 
uh, for African Americans. Uh, and he's actually using data sets to understand uh, why this is so racial bias in uh, denial rates, credit scores, and things like that. So he's actually taken a personal uh, interest in this, and this is what he's modeling. Uh, another student, yeah, so this is, again, his results already from different visualizations, as you can see, uh, you know, uh, uh, Asians to Hispa, you know, all the way to uh, Black uh, and uh, African American alone. And you can see uh, from low income to medium income to high income, how it shifts the way they are actually showing. Yes, this is all data driven visualization. That's exactly a rule. And I'm going to show you a tool in just a second. OK, uh, he's using Python. I don't know if I have time to teach. I may have to come again to teach you guys Python. I don't think I'll have time today because I, I have a whole course on that, but I teach it in a very easy way. You don't need to have any background and within an hour, you will become a Python expert. But uh, I don't think I'll have time to do that today or, uh, or in this talk at least. Uh, here is another student. This visualization, I'll teach you how to do it, uh, is studying Minneapolis shooting and, uh, uh, and he's bringing in racial bias and why are people stopped uh, you know, because of uh, curfew to suspicious and how, you know, and you can see like more, uh, more uh, black Americans, black, I mean, uh, uh, black people are stopped than uh, uh, white people and things like that. So, so he's studying that. Uh, then another student for the first time ever is modeling racism with me. And hopefully this will be a super paper. And she's talking about how people get influenced by other people, become passive racist, anti-racist, and all that stuff. So and then she's going to be doing machine learning on top of this uh, with data sets. So uh, and she's going to also bring education to make sure that more people stay back and not become. So these are all very different societal challenges. OK, uh, another student is studying Ukraine migration uh, for people from mother and I mean, uh, women and children and uh, men uh two different groups she's modeling between poland and she's talking about cyclic migration and things like that this is one of my favorite uh, another student from portland he's working on uh nlps and he's actually this is all done just like with the hackathon i do hackathon with all my students first and come up with ideas and all that stuff so he is uh, taken forty-seven thousand tweets and he's actually doing an NLP with, uh, you know, uh, classical like decision tree random for he's trained everything. And uh, and then he's creating word clouds. He's creating confusion matrices. So when you are presenting at the end, you would like to actually have evidence based research, whatever product that you're creating through your hackathon. So you need all this type of uh, uh, background. So this is a going to another journal. These are all, by the way, I didn't tell you, these are all high school kids. OK, uh, uh, doing work with me. Now, I do have to tell you that all models are wrong, but some are, more, uh, some are useful. This is uh, by George Box, a famous uh, statistician from, uh, uh, from London. And uh, I have a better version of this. All models are wrong, but some are more wrong than the others. OK, so you have to understand your you may be coming up with some quick fixes for your hackathon, but it may be totally you know, wrong until you fully test it. OK, so and uh, so. Uh, I have a whole bunch of things uh, planned, uh, but uh, I'm just thinking now, uh, you know, I, I want to respect your time. Uh, I have to figure out what I should do and what I should not. So let me let me see so that it's useful to you guys. Uh, let me see. Uh, I'm going to skip some and maybe, you know, if you want me to come back and do something, I have lots of techniques here. Uh, I'm just going to think about uh, so. Uh, because the talk was about data, how we collect data and all that stuff, uh, I'm going to start with this one. Uh, so my, most of my students, you know, this is, I don't know if you, you probably already saw the slide, but this is Ben Hammer, uh, you know, from uh, co-founder of Kaggle. He says programming is uh, about writing code is 10%. Figuring out why it does not work is 90%. You will go through this during your hackathon. Analyzing data and machine learning, writing code is only 1%. It's very easy to write. You know, figuring out why the code does not work is 9% of the time. Figuring out what is wrong about the data, that is 90%. This is so important. So if you're going to work with data sets, make sure you understand the bias. You know why you're working with the data and all that. So what I'm going to do in, uh, to respect time, I'm going to show you one. Uh, maybe let me show you two things which will be useful to you. Uh, about which, so I'll just do visualizations and then finish with it. So here is uh, a very famous visualization. If you go to Gap interview, it's a story uh, about, uh, you know, uh, 
Napoleon taking his army from Poland to Moscow and coming back. Now, when you go to the Gap interview, they will uh, show you this picture and just tell you what I just said about, about Napoleon's the battle. And then you have to figure out what's going on. Anyone knows uh, what's going on? This is the most uh, uh, important photo, like most uh, data science -y photo. Anyone knows? What are, what, is, what are all these bands representing and all that stuff? Very good. Uh, it is the number of soldiers, 422,000 soldiers actually walking all the way to Moscow. Uh, so many people died along the way and then coming back uh, again here, this 40,000 becoming 20,000. Any reason why 40,000 became 20,000 here? Well, watch the map. There is a river here. It's the Berezina River and the Berezina River froze. How do I know? Well, there is a temperature plot right here. So it's one of those fascinating plots that talks about geography, you know, and that, that talks about uh, direction, that talks about uh, temperature, that talks about number of people, that talks about a verbal uh, idea. So it's about how you tell the story. So it's about how you tell the story in one graph. So this is where data visualization becomes popular. So maybe I'll just focus on data visualization for the rest of my uh, six or uh, eight minutes. So uh, I want to tell you another story, which is very, very important. And it has to do with uh, uh, not mental health, but some other, uh, some other thing. Again, a notice and wonder, quick notice and wonder. What do you notice? What do you wonder? Type, what do you notice? What do you wonder? What are you seeing? on the chat. What are you noticing? Maybe a map of a city. Very good. What are you wondering about, uh, Ali? I wonder what those dark stains on the map are. Very good wonder. Superb wonder. So uh, the city is London, Soho, London. And uh, the dark stains uh, has to do with, uh, uh, with this guy. Anyone recognize this guy? This guy is very important in history. His name is John Snow. Sir John Snow is the uh, father of epidemiology. And those black spots that you're seeing is cholera deaths in households. And what he did was he went house by house and collected data. And actually, uh, this is his way of telling how many people died in those houses. So it's just a different type of visualization. But we went from geography to history. But then the problem was he had to come up with a way to stop cholera. If you did not know the story of cholera, you need to really think about uh, uh, what he did. Okay, You need to learn about this. So what he did was he collected data and he presented this, but he had a battle. The, he had a battle with the doctors. Now, the battle was he claimed that uh, cholera spread through water. Everybody in uh, all the major doctors who were all uh, you know, men, mostly, they, they said like, no, 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 it cannot be. It has to come from air. In fact, now literacy time, miasma. They said it's because of miasma. Miasma means toxic air. So he, they said it's so he had to prove to people that uh, it comes from water. Of course, he talked about science now. So talk about STEM. So science, so bacteria, virus, and things like that. But it didn't fly. And guess what he did later? He basically went back to those same places and found out that in each of those places, there was a pump, water pump. And then he figured out where the most of the deaths happened was at Broad Street Pump. Then he used one of the most ingenious methods and something that many people hate, a subject called mathematics. Unfortunately, in high school, you're all taught something in mathematics about a certain line. And I'm going to tell you a certain line that is perpendicular to another line and bisects it. You probably learned this in your high school. A line that is perpendicular to another line and bisects it. Very good, John. You caught the pun in the definition. Very good. Perpendicular bisector. So that is one thing. Another thing is if you stand on the perpendicular bisector, you are equidistant from the two endpoints. So what he did, he basically used that idea and found out from which pumps people were walking the closest, like the same distance. And so... Can you believe it? In 1854, somebody used a random math uh, definition that you, you tend to ignore in your high school. And he actually figured out that the pump on Broad Street was the one causing the deaths. So they closed it and cholera was controlled. If you did not know the story, next time you go to UK, please stop by this pump. I asked the tour guide last time when I was in UK. 
And I said, why don't you talk about this pump? You're talking about Big Ben and Buckingham Palace and all that stuff. And he's, you know what he said? He said, nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. This is, this is why I want to go back to my uh, original one. Please solve problem for impact. Okay. So, uh, and so this is one of those situations where, and then this I can teach you in like 10 minutes. I can teach you how to do simulations. I, that's not the purpose of my talk today. You know, so it's like, then you can show spread and make your hackathon nice and win the things and all this stuff. It's not, I, 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 it's this is the least of my concerns. My thing is, is, did you actually come up with a good solution? Okay. So, and finally, McKinsey did this big survey and wanted to know which are the most five most popular charts. Believe it or not, the five most popular charts are these guys. So when you want to present, you don't want to do all sorts of jazzy charts. Sometimes it's simple charts like this is good enough. So I'm going to just finish with some simple uh, things about presentation. Like uh, we are in a healthy industry, 11 performance measures across three types of companies and industries are very healthy. And the consultant that uh, uh, came in presents this. So this is for your final presentation for hackathon do you think this is a good a good way to present like 11 attributes and like three uh uh three types of companies such a bad way to present right this is this is, believe it or not many companies are doing this still really not visual very poor so uh another one our sales has considerably increased in 1996 is this a good way to present I'm, I'm helping you to do a good job when you present finally. Is this a good way to present? What's wrong with it? Not accurate. Yes. Uh, it's not clear what pie we are talking about. What's the piece of the pie? And, and uh, you know, the harder to see, uh, see the growth, right? What would be a better graph for this, guys? What would be a better graph for this? Very good. A line plot would have been much simpler, right? So, so pick... So messaging is very important. Pick the right graph, right? So it's very, very important. Compared to four of our competitors, we rank uh, first on return on investment with 14%. And here is the answer. Here is the chart. Is this a good chart? Not really. So a good chart would be, a, you know, something to compare because I'm comparing, comp uh, you know, companies and all that. Our market share has increased since 1996. Is this a good chart? Absolutely not, because I really cannot. Uh, I mean, this is really a comparison chart. Essentially, you know, you should be drawing uh, bars right next to each other. Like the last one, opinion polls show equal support. And don't give me uh, like 50% and the other 50%. It's a waste of marketing money. It's a waste. I mean, if I were a Shark Tank judge, I would totally kill this project because of just this one thing. Right. So it's a very important thing. So uh, so uh, I want you to understand and maybe you will end up presenting. So each one of the things, if you are going to show off uh, based on component uh, or item or time series or frequency or correlation, you know, you want to make sure you do the right chart. OK, so say the right chart for the right messaging. And finally, don't show graphs to me like this where you're showing me that the ice cream sales went up and the shark sales, shark attacks, is also showing the same trend. What's the problem here? It's classic. Causation versus correlation. So essentially, there's a confounding variable called temperature. It's summer. It's hot. Everybody is, the, is at the beach and they are eating ice creams and... And, you know, going to the beach and uh, being eaten by a shark. Okay. And with that good news, I will stop and uh, uh, be, uh, you know, I have tons of things to present. But uh, uh, let me ask. I know I'm over time. Uh, can I take uh, three minutes to show a visualization tool which you could use for your hackathon? Or if it's over time, no problem. Sure. I can stop. Sure. Sure, Padu. Thank you so much. Can I take three minutes? <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay, so you're going to enjoy this. I, I can bet on it. Nobody has seen this because this is in the first high school class that we have introduced. Okay, and just work with me and then you can do this. I mean, this is all my GitHub for uh, Python. I was going to show you, but I'm not going to show you today. So the tool I want to show you, and I, I hope you will use this, and my students are already using for uh, lots of societal challenges. It's called CodeApp. And uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised that CodeApp is uh, it's, uh, starting from all the way from middle school. I actually have like... 
uh, fifth, five year olds actually using this and all that stuff, and six year olds playing with it. So the way you start is, is start with launch code app. Code app stands for common online data analysis platform. Uh, there are two options that you will get. One is create a new document. One is open document. These are built-in uh, data sets. Create a new document is what I ask my students to do when they do projects because they'll import massive CSV files about police violence and things like that. And then we do visualization. Now, I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to just use a doc, I'll use something that is already there. I'm going to use some example. I'm going to use the famous example of roller coasters. I, I hope you all know what a roller coaster is. And here is data for 157 roller coasters. Now you can see as a teacher, I can make a text box and there's a text box tool right there. And I can give instructions about this thing and I can I can tell you, I can ask questions, uh, some deeper questions. So let's look at the data for a second. It's the data of the, there's the state here, there's the name of the coaster, there's the name of the park, there's the top speed, the maximum height, drop, length, duration, type, design, ear open, age group, inversion, does it go backwards, forwards, and all that stuff. So you got all these things called attributes and all that. So uh, I'm going to, uh, okay. So so essentially, uh, when you look at this data set, when you look at this data set, what, what is that you are seeing? So if you look at this data set, what's the first thing that strikes you when you are, if you are, if you are ever going to do in your hackathon data sets, what's the first thing, for example, this cell here, what does it say? What does it tell you? The cell you see is empty. So when you import data sets, you're obviously going to see sometimes that cells are missing. This is called, this is what prompts you to do data cleaning. Believe it or not, 80% of the data scientists are sitting and cleaning data. If you don't have a clean data, then you're not doing, a good, you know, working with real good data. Of course, if you have a million rows and you're just having like, 10 rows that are missing data, you can eliminate those 10 rows and then you can work with the rest of the data. There's so many ways, unstructured big data. Okay, now let's play a simple game that I'm teaching to middle schoolers so that you guys can learn also. Uh, uh, you know, John, you have been uh, so uh, engaging. So tell me on the chat, what would you like to know as a kid uh, about roller coasters? Like from the data set, what would you like to know? Tell me one thing. In fact, let me uh, start with something and then you can, as you're making up your mind. So you see all the graphs, all the roller coasters. Let me touch one of the roller coasters. It's pretty dynamic. It's right there. That's it's six flags and all that. So that's the roller coaster. Now, John, speed. So John wants to know which is the fastest roller coaster. So watch. This is the, you know, I've given challenge to some of the top institutions to do this. Uh, it's the different versions of it. Yesterday, I spoke to, at seven uh, Thursday, I spoke to Uganda. Uh, to 3,500 people in one hour, okay? I don't know how many people I'm speaking to right now. They had the most unique uh, concept of 90 hubs. Each of the hubs had like uh, uh, 40 to 50 people, and that's how it was 3,600 people. So uh, watch, and I did code app, exactly this. Watch, uh, John. I'm pulling top speed right here and placing it right here. There it is. It's already assigned. All the roller coasters are there. I'm going to find out which one it is for you. It's the top thrill dragster. Okay, next. Uh, uh, Arul Raj, you were actually, uh, you give me, yeah, you give me one that you want to know besides the speed. Would you like to know which one is the maximum height? Yes, let me show you. Uh, let me put another graph. I'm going to put maximum height here. So I'm going to pull maximum height, put it right there. I'm going to go hover over it. Ah, top thrill dragster. What is the next curiosity? Now I'm bringing my educator's hat. Top thrill dragster seems to be the fastest. Top thrill dragster seems to be the maximum height. What are you curious about? What are you curious about now? Give me a hypothesis. Very important when you do hackathons and a hypothesis. Well, design is a qualitative variable here, but a hypothesis. Hypothesis is if this, then that. A hypothesis. Just by what we just did, top thrill dragster happens to be the maximum height. Top thrill dragster happens to be the top speed. I won't be surprised if top thrill dragster ha also happens to have the biggest drop. Let me try it. I'm going to put the drop here. And it also happens to be probably the biggest drop as well. So now I'm curious. Exactly. It, does height relate with speed? When you do your hackathon, study these relationships. directly. Are they directly proportional? Now, how do I do this as a graph? As a visualization, how do I do this? Well, if one is X, the other one is Y. So let's take the maximum height, place it on this side. Voila. Yes. Linear. How do I know it's a linear trend? Well, they have a ruler for you. Press the ruler. 
and you get the movable line. This is where I, I play with my students, whose line is it anyway? And you can play with your ruler and show off. And then I have to disappoint them as a devil's advocate and say, that's least squares. Welcome to linear regression. Don't you, don't you want uh, this type of introduction to linear regression when you were in high school? Wouldn't it have been cooler and learned literally about what linear regression is? And then I teach you what is R squared. Unfortunately, the educational system is, is, you know, is exactly the opposite. They tend to go, here is the mathematics, go solve the problem. Here is the science, go solve the problem. Let's all challenge ourselves to reverse this philosophy. Here is the problem. Let's find the mathematics to do it. Okay. Let's exactly all the good points on the on chat. Final cool, cool thing. You can actually take a map of the United States. You can do this if you're in India. You can do this in India. And I want to make a data-driven decision. And I'm going to stop. I want to take a data-driven decision for my family to take them to roller coasters. And I want to go to a different state. So I look at this uh, data set and I see there is a uh, type. I'm going to bring the type into the picture. Green, I see green is steel roller coasters. Uh, wooden is these uh, red roller coasters. I wanted to go to Texas. I almost wanted to buy my tickets. And then I look, looked at this and said, because I made all the stocks with my friend in Texas, I'm going to come to Dallas and I'm going to, you may get and take me to uh, this uh, Titan steel, blah, blah, blah. Then I realized all of them are steel roller coasters. None of my none of my family members like steel roller coasters. My friends, I just made as a father a data driven decision. I will not take my family to Texas for a roller coaster trip. Okay, with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm going to put my LinkedIn and all that stuff for you guys, so you guys can contact me anytime. Uh, go ahead. Any questions? Thank you. Come Thank ahead. you so much for the awesome presentation. And uh, I hope it was useful for everyone. And uh, uh, Padu is the uh, most helpful, uh, you know, mathematician and professor I know. So feel free to reach out to him if you're looking to do a project uh, in data science or, uh, you know, learn uh, uh, significantly faster, uh, like he just showed today. Thank you. And uh, uh, Pradeep Singh, thank you, Pradeep. <laughs> now I know who you are. OK, good. Thanks, Lux, for this opportunity. And wonderful that you're doing a data, uh, you know, and yeah, anytime. So just my big message for today, embrace failure and uh, respect empathy. OK, so those are two very important words when you're doing uh, uh, hackathons and all that stuff. OK, good luck to all of you. OK, take care, guys.